Unfortunately, I mean, last year, in fact, I didn't use this book because I was sort of annoyed that they didn't use NumPy, and then I decided to just get over it. I'll teach you NumPy. You can use everything straight out of the book if you want. There will not be assignments that are required to use NumPy, but believe me, you will decide it's probably easier to do lots of stuff with NumPy. Um, so NumPy is the numeric Python, scientific Python package. It's got a whole bunch of stuff for fast, multidimensional arrays. The vector and class and stuff used in the book for matrices are flexible but not extremely fast. Um, they also have plotting tools, things to deal with images and whatever, and we'll do a bunch of things with those, and a bunch of scientific functions. They really come in two parts. SciPy is the bigger package for which NumPy is a piece of it that has the things we will use. There's a couple of things we will use from SciPy, or I'll recommend you use, because it has a whole library for doing linear algebra. Right? The right answer for how do you compute an eigenvalue is not to ever implement it yourself unless you're in an advanced graduate course. You use somebody else's library, just like you don't implement your own compilers. Right? You use somebody else's tools. So a couple of helpful sites. Uh, the SciPy documentation page is docs.scipy.org, and then there's a bunch of references underneath it. So um, it's not sci-fi, it's sci-pi, but you know, maybe it's a genre you'll get into. Um, and there's a decent tutorial for a bunch of stuff. Do not spend your time reading all of those right now. We will only use maybe the linear algebra package and whatever. There's a ton of other stuff in there. The other one that is useful um, is the file I.O. If you, if you need to start, especially for other projects, not within this class, to do some weird file I.O., there's stuff there that will be really useful. Um, but we'll only use that piece of it. NumPy we will use extensively, or I recommend you use extensively. It's inside of SciPy. So if you go to the SciPy top level page, you'll get, then get to the NumPy uh, manual page, um, the NumPy user's guides. You might want to at least read through the quick start tutorial and some of the basics. Although I'm going to cover most of the basics today. In fact, many of the examples I have are taken exactly out of that. Um, so some other helpful links. I forgot to mention this. Um, so let me go back to my... Uh, I'm not a, a big a user, mostly because I live inside of Emacs. Uh, and if you're using some other IDE, you may not actually care about this. But there's this nice um, another version of Python called IPython, Interactive Python. It's a little bit different in terms of its prompts, but it has some other features that some of you may like. Since you can do things like look at your directory, it does auto completion. So if I wanted to say the function, or it doesn't do auto completion in Emacs because I disable that, but if you're on the command line, it will auto complete a bunch of stuff for you. So if you're doing like a function and you open a parentheses, it'll tell you a little bit about the help function, whatever. IPython is useful. The other part about IPython that makes it pretty useful is that it actually has this nice workbook version, um, which is part of why it doesn't work for me because I don't want to leave Emacs. It will fire up a web browser and show you as you're working on Python, basically build a web page with your Python and the answers, your Python and the answers, whatever. And for some people, that's a style they like. They like their code and images or their code and output mixed together. If that's a style you like to use, you might want to consider exploring the IPython uh, notebook um, for doing things. It actually is a useful thing if you want to turn in your homework by doing it in IPython, because then you sort of have the code and the images and stuff embedded. That's OK. You can save your notebook and use that to turn it in. Um, the other, we're going to go through a bunch of uh, matplotlib stuff, including some images, but I just wanted to early on in this PowerPoint have the example, oh, sorry, the links. Matplotlib is a library for doing lots of plotting that goes with uh, SciPy, and we'll use that. For example, you want to read an image. Chapter 2 showed you some images, but it didn't show you how to read them. Okay, Matplotlib, and we'll, we'll, by the time we're done this tutorial, you'll see how to read them. It's like one line. It's really easy. So. Okay, so on to uh, NumPy and, and Array. So um, basic lists were sort of nice for storing, storing small amounts of one-dimensional data. You can beat up lists in Python to make multi-dimensional data because you can have lists with nested <laughs> lists or whatever. Python's OK, but it's really limited in that. Um, you can't do nice things like two array, take two arrays and add them. Right? If I have array 1 plus array 2, it appends the two lists. Right? It doesn't add them element-wise or whatever you might want to think about. Um, the, the coding the matrix is vector class is okay, but it's slow and more limited unless you want very sparse things. Um, but they want it to be more self-contained and not depend on stuff, which makes sense. Um, so uh, to use NumPy, it's much more efficient, and you basically say import NumPy. It's similar but much more capable. We're going to go through a lot of those structures. 
So there's a couple ways of using it. So one way, uh, and this is true for lots of packages in Python, I can say from numpy import star. Okay, this is actually not the preferred way of doing stuff in Python, but it gives you the advantage that it imports everything into the command shell, and now I don't have to reference them in funny ways. And I'll show you uh, reference classes later on. But for some of what I'm going to do, it just makes it easy because now array is something I directly access. Um, also, if I was using IPython, I could say IPython dash PyLab, and that automatically imports NumPy, Matplotlib, and SciPy. So you get all those things without having to worry about importing them. Um, IPython gives you numbered output stuff. Lots of the stuff I do will be in triple brackets because I work inside of, not inside of IPython, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, actually, given our time, I'm going to have to go faster, so I'm going to skip a few slides that you can read. All, all the, the PowerPoints from today's lecture, um, but not all the answers to the, the clicker, so not the clicker questions, but all these slides are uploaded in the PDF. Maybe even the clicker questions. I can't remember. I might have done them. Uh, they're not just these. Okay, um, so simple operations. So there's a base class called an array. And I can say array, and I index it, so array takes as an argument, in this case a list, and it gives me back an array. So notice the odd representation, array. The answer of A plus B is an answer, but it is an array. So it shows me that it's an array. Um, there are lots of math functions. So just like I had the range function, I can make an, uh, an array range, A range, of 11, which gives me the value 0 to 10. So it doesn't include the last one, starts at zero. Um, I can do things with arrays like multiply all of them by constants. Um, so I can define an array. Uh, sorry, here I have a scalar, um, a, 2 pi. Pi is a predefined constant in NumPy, uh, so it's e. Um, I can look at the value, and then I can multiply scalar times array. Okay, And if that array was an image, I can multiply 2 times an image, and the image will get twice as bright in terms of what images do. I can also do in-place operations. I can do times equals, plus equals, um, and I can apply functions to them. So I can take the sign of an array, and it, we'll talk about what that looks like in a little bit. Um, so creation, did I just, oh, so, so in addition to creation them, I can check its type. It'll tell me it's a NumPy ND array. I can check the data type of it, so the class, I'll show you the class structure in a bit. Um, knows that, it, in this case, it's an array of integers, 32-bit integers, as opposed to 8-bit integers or 16-bit integers, there's multiple types. It tells me that each one of those items is four bytes long. That's what item size tells me. How many bytes of memory is it in raw sense? It'll tell me the shape. In this case, the array is four comma, so it's one dimensional of length four. Um, and because I, uh, shape is also a function, because I did the import star, I can just take shape as an operator. So I can either ask the object its shape or apply a shape operator to it. The same is true for size. Um, I can ask it how much memory is it using. This is useful if I want to like read and write them because I can find out all of the memory. A number of dimensions. I can make a copy. Okay, and what do you think this is? Low copy or, sorry, uh, deep copy or shallow copy? Which means does it make a pointer or does it use the, the uh, a new copy of all the memory? New copy. So copy makes a copy, um, deep copy. Um, you can also go back and forth to lists. So I can do lists and lists, oh, sorry, two lists and list of A and get them in and out. Okay. Array indexing in Python is zero. Um, in, sorry, in NumPy. Um, with enough effort, you can change that, but don't. <laughs> um, you can fill them with values. Um, you can also use the slice operators. We're going to talk more about slicing in just a bit. So I can assign a whole bunch of values equal to one. It is faster to use the fill operator if I want to fill a big array with data. For small arrays, it doesn't matter. You can do whatever you want. Um, you do want to be a little careful of array uh, of type conversions. If, uh, so here I have A's type is int32. If I assign A sub 0 equals 10.6, Unlike Python, where if I saw, I'd, assi I'd assign an, a, a, a list element a float, it'll gladly store floats and in, in integers together in an array, in a list. In a NumPy array, it has a type, and when you assign, it casts it to that type. Hmm? They're homogenous, and you can't change them easily. Right? You have to actually go in and explicitly change the type, um, which is part of why they're faster. 
Right? They really are C arrays. Right? They are under the cover. They're implemented in C. Um, and uh, fill has the same behavior. So once it's an integer 32 array, assigning does not change things. This is probably one of the bigger differences between in and lists. They behave very differently with respect to that. Um, hmm? Oh, for that one, uh, we're just going to skip. Well, actually, no, no, I, sh I should do this, right? We'll just fire up the clicker. Is it over there someplace? Uh, I can't tell. Did it take it or not? Yeah, I can't touch it. <laughs> You can't touch this. <laughs> there we go. Forty-five. Did we lose some people at break? They never came back. Didn't. Don't know what the homework is. So, this shouldn't be a very hard question. So. Get your last answer in. Okay. Okay, so slicing. Um, slicing is a way of getting inside an array and getting parts of it, parts out of it. Probably don't need much of this for this assignment, but I figured I'll show it to you anyhow. It's actually one of the things that makes arrays powerful in Python, also in MATLAB, why people like it. But um, so if I have an array, so I can have array sublists. So if I have this array L. I can say L1 colon 3, and it's going to go in and give me 1 through 3. And you know, just to be different from the range operator, this is inclusive. <laughs> so, so this gives me from 1 to 3, including 1 and 3. Um, consistency is not Python's <laughs> biggest point. Um, negative indices are OK. They actually do some interesting things. So if I ask for a negative index, it says, I'm going to go from 1 to minus 2. So it's going to go over here and say minus 2. I'm going to count 2 in. 1, 2. And now it's going to give me the values 11 and 12. The negative indices are not inclusive. <laughs> minus 1 means the end of the array. Minus 2 is in from the array. Um, and you can use minus indices at the beginning. It's not just the beginning of the thing. So negative indices have useful things when I want to count in from the end of the array. So I can count in 4. One, two, three, four, and I'm at 11. And then I can go from 11 to 12 by counting from minus 4 to 3. Yeah. Did you set the slice thing to 1, 2, 8, 3? Oh, you're right. So it is, it is not like, so it's not like range. So it's the, ne it's the negative ones that are not inclusive, the positive ones. So it goes from 1 to 3, but not including 3. It's the negative ones that, that do the, the weird thing, not the positive ones. My bad. Right, so, so negative 2 goes from here, minus 1, minus 2, and then goes right, to the left of that. I guess it's also not inclusive, right? It doesn't include the minus 2. Um, if I don't have an indice, so if I just have L uh, square bracket colon 3, it says implicitly start at 0, go to 3. Um, you can also grab the last two elements, minus 2 to, not, to whatever. Um, every other element. So there's actually the, the option of having a second colon, which is the lower value, the upper value in the step. So if you're used to for, for loops and languages that can go like from this value to that, this value, stepping by that value. So I can go every other value, start at 0, go to the end, and step by 2. So then it grabs the 10, the 12, and the 14. And you can step by lots of values. Um, in multi-dimensional arrays, this becomes more interesting because now I have a two-dimensional array. So I define a two-dimensional array by having array square bracket, square bracket. The first row, close square bracket, <laughs> comma. The second row, close square bracket, close square bracket. So that gives me an array that's a 2D array of four columns, two rows. And then I can ask it shape. And it'll tell me two, four, two rows, four columns because they do row, column, row, column, right? That's the way they're going to always describe stuff. Um, size, size tells me how many elements are in it, not its shape. So size just tells me there's eight elements. The number of dimensions is two. <coughs> I can access either by getting or setting by saying square bracket. So I can, a, I can say a square bracket 1 comma 3 equals minus 1, and it changes that item. 
a sub 1 gives me a row, right? Because I didn't have a second square bracket. Right? How do you think I would get the first column? So I could say a, hmm? right, so I could say a square bracket colon square bracket zero, right? So it says don't care about what the first index is, use the whole range. Remember, we actually saw that the, the colon operator here um, somewhere was everything, right? So this just will do everything. Okay, so array slicing in Python um, works very much like Slicing for lists. We haven't actually talked about multiple for lists, but you can do some slicing. Most of that stuff I just described is also true for Python for indexing in lists. So I can step in lists, get the first, second, and third item. I can do all of this kind of stuff. It's just a lot faster in NumPy. Um, so I can do a four colon four colon start at four. So if this is a 2D array, think of this as an image, for example, and I want to grab a piece of it, I can start at the fourth index and go to the end. That's, this is that stuff in the blue square. If I want to do the orange square here, or the orange rectangle, that's A sub 0, first row, from 3 to 5. And it gives me these two values. This column is A colon, comma, 2. It's colon saying all of the rows, comma, 2, second column. Right? So I can get these things in and out. Um, it is interesting to note that when it gave me this array, it is not a vertical column. It's a one-dimensional array. It doesn't care if I took it from a row or a column. It's now a one-dimensional array. And that will be important when we deal with certain linear algebra things. And for all of these, I, you can do strides. Okay. Um, you can also do, um, now, this is important. The, the, the copy operator made a copy. But if I'm doing slices, as opposed to the colon operator in Python, which makes a copy, slices here make references. NumPy wanted to be efficient, so if I say b equals a sub 2, right, I get 2, 3, those two items, but when I say b sub 0 equals 10, b sub 0 is an array of two items, the first of which is 2, the second of which is 3, but when I change b sub 0 to 10, a has changed. Okay, so big difference. Arrays in NumPy, when I make slices, colon operators, all these things, they are not copies because it's expensive. And lots of times people don't want to make copies. There are some ways of doing copies. We'll see those in the next slide. Um, so I can use, in fact, I'll, I'll do this one first. The easiest way to make a, a copy when you're using any kind of indexing operators is to use the take function. That says take the data out of that and make a copy. Okay, But Python allows some very fancy indexing. So I can say... If I have A is now a, a, a range from 0 to 80 by 10s, so it's the array 0, 10, 20, 30, we're up to 80. If I say A sub list 1, 2, minus 3, okay, that's going to go out and it's going to grab the first item out of the list. It's going to make a new list, and this is actually a copy, um, with the 10, the 20, the first item, the second item, and the minus third item, so counting in from 8 gets down to 50. And it makes an array. And I can do that also using the take operator. Okay. Um, I can also do some odd indexing where I use Booleans to say, <laughs> use this dimension or not. Don't need to know that. Probably won't use it much in this class. But you can do that as a mask. And then it's going to say, oh, look, you wanted 1, 2, and 5. So it'll give me 10, 20, 50. Right? Because it's going to use this Boolean vector as a mask. Um, and you can actually use a function to compress that and give me back a uh, value from the, actually it'll give me back the mask, take A, and give me back a new value for Y. Now the indexing operator, probably won't need this, but I'd still like to mention it because it is one of the things you'll see in various people's code. The indexing operator in Python can be really fancy. So in 2D, instead of passing in just a single value, I can pass in tuples. So I can take the array, which is now a 2D array, I can say one, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 is a tuple, comma, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is a tuple. And what that's saying is it's going to pair these up. 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5. That's the orange items coming out of this array. 
I can say 3 colon, which is now the numbers 3 to the n, comma, the list 0 to 5. That's the blue here. It says go from 3 to the n in things in, zero, in, in columns 0, 2, and 5. They don't have to be contiguous. Um, if I use tuples, I get pairs. If I use arrays, I get everything. Um, and then you can make masks and play games the same with masks with this fancy indexing. Um, so uh, just based on that, we just talked about that. Think for a second. I'm actually going to do clicker questions given how far behind we are. We're just going to plow through a bunch of stuff here. Um, from, if I did from NumPy import this, here's an array. I assign C equals A2 colon 3. D equals A square bracket, square bracket 1. B0 equals 10. What happens to A? What's the value of A now? Somebody, we'll just do quick hand questions here. What value changed? B sub 0 equals 10. Did anything change? Nope. Take doesn't change things. C sub 10 equals 20. C is a slice. Things do change. D sub 0 equals 30. A sub square bracket. So this is fancy indexing. Fancy indexing makes a copy. Nothing changes. Okay, so just a little bit. You, you'll never be tested on this part, but I just want to explain how stuff is implemented for those who uh, think under the covers. Um, your array data structures. So in memory, in your computer, everything is memory. Right? You're, you have RAM. Gigs of RAM, it is contiguous memory. There is no 2D array in memory. There is memory. Right? 2D array is how we interpret it. So in that block of memory, Python might view it as a block of 3 by 3 if I have uh, nine items, right? That's fine. In fact, Python has a data structure that will tell it that it's got a type pointing to floats. It tells me that it has two dimensions. The dimensions are 3, 3, 4, 12. Oh, sorry, stride is 4. Oh, sorry, 12 and 4. So there's 12 bytes per row and 4 bytes per item, okay? And then if I choose to go into Python and I play around with it, it leaves the block of memory the same and just changes the ND array structure. If I make a copy, let's say I wanted to, to make it into a 1D vector, okay? I can do that. So Python has a special index called none, which inserts a new axis. So I can actually take my 1D array and increase it. And if I say y is equal to a of none colon, none comma colon, it says make a 2D array that currently has no nothing. It's just it's now one row. Or it's now three columns in one row. Data didn't change. It just changed that data structure to say, oh, look, the number of dimensions has changed. The memory is exactly the same. If I were to have said colon, comma, none, again, it just changes that internal representation and says, oh, look, you have three items, but now they're a column. No copy, no changes to these things. And heck, I can make it 3D and say it's three by one by one by saying, a colon comma none comma none. Now it's a it's a 3D array. It just has one one stack in depth. Okay. Um, NumPy supports a whole bunch of types. Don't have to really go into them. But you need to know that there's different kinds of integers and they're not interchangeable. So if I want uint eight, which is commonly used for integers, uh, sorry for images, that's an eight bit integer. So everything's just zero to two fifty five. Um, uint thirty two is thirty two bit integers. Um, you can actually have, and I will show you in a second, arrays of strings. In fact, I can have arrays of objects. Arrays don't have to just, despite that it's called NumPy, they don't all have to be numbers. Um, I'm not going to go through these. I just wanted to give you sort of a nice list of, there's a whole bunch of operators that we've already covered in terms of basic shape. There's functions like flatten, which will take an, an iterator through an array as if it's 1D. So if I want to step through a 2D array in order, I can just call flat or flatten. One returns a copy, one returns a reference as an iterator. Ravel is really the same, but it returns a view if possible. So it tries to return a non, uh, sorry, co not a copy if it can. Sometimes it can't. Depends on what you ask Ravel to do. Um, I can resize a matrix, so I can like extend it in some other dimension. It will gladly do that. I can swap the axes. I can transpose them. Um, 
uh, I'm not going to go through all the operators. There's a copy and a fill, make copies. I can convert, I can coerce them. So I can convert them into a list. I can convert them into a string. Um, I can view them in different ways. I'll skip complex numbers. Um, sorry, I went the wrong way. I can save them to a file. So I can save the packed binary form of them by giving it a file. Um, I can also get back an object, which they call the pickle. I have no idea why it's called pickle, but you know, it's like storing it for later use, preserving it. Um, maybe that's why it's pickle. Hmm? Yeah, that's the best reason I can think of why, but it's like, um, except I eat pickles, and then they're no longer there. It's like, they're not permanent. <laughs> um, so you can save them in various formats. Um, and then there's some really powerful operators, which people will use all the time. So you'll see these applied to things. So I can give me all the indices of things that are non-zero. I can sort them in place. So if I have a NumPy array of, num of numbers or of strings, I can just take that array.sort, and it will sort them for me. I can arg sort, arg sort them. It will return indices such that I can now iterate through them in order. And I can search through them in various ways. I can play with math operators, clip, round, sum, product, min, max, or arg min, mean, variance, standard deviation. I can do all kinds of mathematics over them without messing with them. And it's very fast for those operators. Much faster than if you wrote a loop. So it's good to know those. These are all, like NumPy. These are all NumPy stuff, yeah. This is why NumPy is so much more powerful as all these built-in operators for their, their lists or their arrays. Um, okay, another quick clicker question. So I've never done these lectures. I got to know how bad they are. <laughs> no, it's working. It's trying to start up. When I can't touch it, then I. Yeah, it's giving me a uh, network error. Yeah, it's trying to reconnect to the network. Okay. So now, now is it started? Okay. It's probably me timing out because these questions are now very far apart. So. Well, these are not really critical. I got a distribution already, so I'll give you a, a minute or two, and then or a couple seconds, and I'll move move on. I don't think one or two more votes are going to make a huge difference. Yeah, yes, yeah, so I can't tell, right? So, but luckily these don't count for score, so. <laughs> Okay, so um, uh, NumPy also has a specialized matrix object, object. Even though I can have an ND array that's of dimension two, there are certain operators who won't let me do unless I use a matrix. Um, because there are certain operations that are well-defined for matrices that are not for others. Otherwise, it, lots of places it'll convert back and forth. Um, so I define a matrix, so I can do mat, place in some values. Notice that for mat, I can also create them from a string. They do that for compatibility with MATLAB. I can still create it with arrays. Um, when I print them, they, they look nice. I can do things like exponentiation. I can do matrix multiplication um, and access subarrays and whatever. We'll talk more about that when we get to the matrix uh, class, and, and we'll talk more about matrices later. I just want to show you that they're there. Um, and the rest of these, I'm going to sort of uh, oh, vectorizing functions. So one of the things that make Python popular is that not only does it do all these array NumPy arrays fast, it allows you to build vectorized functions. And these vectorized functions are very well parallelized. They actually use the multiple instruction sets of, uh, from Intel and AMD to make a whole bunch of stuff much faster. Um, so if I try and just call the sync, I have a function here, sync, and I try and call it with an array, it'll barf saying, I don't know what to do with an array. But if I load from NumPy the function called vectorize, I can make a new function without writing any new code, vsync equals vectorize sync. And now I can pass it arrays, and it will be much faster than if you wrote a vector function yourself for most of this. And then I can do things like pass it arrays, and then I can pass it arrays and do things like plot, where here I said, you know, give me a bunch of points, um, space from minus 5 to 5, um, give me 101 points space between them. 
that's a vector or an array. Now I can plot that is the x value, sync of x2 is the y value, and I quickly get a plot. So in those two functions, given that I vectorize it, I get a plot function. So I can do a bunch of stuff pretty quick. So it's worth knowing about that. You won't need that for this assignment, but I wanted to stick it in. Before I get to the next thing, which again, you don't need, but I wanted to cover more of, of NumPy. And some of this you could accidentally run into, so I want you to know about it because it's there's some non-intuitive things for NumPy. Um, so if I take two uh, four by three and four by three arrays and add them, it will add them. And in fact, it's um, you know just going to gladly go ahead and operate those. It gives me this answer. However, if I mess up and I take a four by three array and a one by three array, Python does what's called broadcasting. And I, this slide is not, I don't know why I duplicated this column, but um, it's going to stretch. Oh, that's so I can do this, right? It's supposed to be animated, but this will stretch down. So it'll take the one by three and said, oh, you needed it to be four by three. I'm going to expand it for you. And now it'll be a four by three and it will add it. Okay. And it expands it now downward. Right. Now, it's, if it's four by three, in fact, there's only one easy way to make a three by one do anything meaningful. But if it was a three by three, you might get some very confusing answers if you accidentally add an array that's 1D to a 2D array. Instead of getting an error message, Python will say, oh, you meant to broadcast it. And I will expand it for you and add it for you. And you can accidentally do that during the assignment and get some weird results. Um, it'll do even more fun stuff. If I take a 4 by 1 plus a 1 by 3, it'll stretch this one that way and this one down and still give you a 4 by 3 result. Because those it's basically going to copy the values over. Okay, So if I take things that I might not have intended and do certain NumPy operations with them, it'll do it. So you have to be a little careful what will happen. Um, there are some rules. I can't take a 4 by 3 plus a 1 by 4. It's going to say those values are not aligned. Of course, it had been a 3 by 3 and a 1 by 3. In this case, you might have meant to put the 4 first. Because if I did a 1 by 4 plus a 4 by 3, then it will extend it. Because some of the dimensions match. But not, it's 4 by 1 plus a 4 by 3. It'll extend that one this way and add them. But not if you give them a different order. So you have to be a little careful. Um, so um, I sort of already did that example. Um, these can, can get pretty complicated um, because you can play with games in depth. So it's a very powerful operator. I will actually just briefly mention that if I take here, so O grid gives me a, a spacing of data. I can take the data. And then I can, so here I take range 27. That gives me the values 0 through 26, so it's 27 numbers. Reshape them to be a 3 by 3 by 3 array. So this just made a cube. And now I can do this sort of fancy indexing where x sub i and y sub i are these 0 to 3 numbers. z is this weird array. And then if I print those out, I'm just I'm going to go through this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time getting you to think about it. You can go through these slides and sort of get a feel for what this does. <coughs> it cuts out a weird slice of the data through the cube. Because uh, here's the data cube. The horizon array is indexing 0, 4, 8. So it's cutting back down the diagonal, 10, 13, 17, 10, 13, 17. It's complicated. You can do these really complica complex operators. And I just wanted you to see this. Because again, if you accidentally take your arrays and give them indices from other things, Python does some pretty complicated stuff with it. It can be a little hard to understand. So if you were trying to understand this, what, what didn't I do that would help you understand this? Okay, and this is useful because somebody may play with somebody else's Python right? I didn't show you xi and yi. If you were to print xi and yi and then zi, you can start to see what the pattern of this data is. Okay, and I, and I didn't mention this, but in Python, you can actually add a line to your code at any point in time to throw yourself into the debugger. Um, the Python debugger is pydb or pydb, right? And then you can print the value of variables. So if you're, if you're dealing with a program assignment and you're getting stuff you don't understand what's going on, you can stick in print statements, but Python does have a debugger. And one of the really nice things about the debugger is you can actually have statements that say, like, if x is less than 0, 
call the Python debugger. So you can like, and then it'll toss you in the interpreter and you can figure out what your variables are doing. So looking at that data is pretty useful. Um, you can play with ASCII data. There's nothing in what we talked about. So I can have arrays of strings and do that. In fact, it's very common. There's a couple of built-in functions called CSV readers. So I can import CSV and read a CSV comma separated values like from Excel into an array. And if they're integers, or floats, it'll make an array of numbers. If they're strings or mixed types, it'll give you an array of strings. Um, and you can play some games with those. I'm, I'm not, you don't have to use any of this. I'm just showing you stuff so you have some broad overview of what's going on. You can have arrays of complex structures. So I can define a type that's got multiple fields in it, and then I can fill my array where I give it the, de the D type. Oops. D type here equals this format. I define this new type that's got structures in it. And I can get an array with strings plus data mixed together. And now plus doesn't have much meaning because it doesn't do what you would expect it to do. Um, depending on exactly what that structure was, Python may gladly take another one and let you add two of them and do something weird like append the strings and add the numbers, which may or may not be meaningful to you. Um, skipping over all that. So um, we're actually going to skip over that one just because I don't have time. I got to make sure we get through everything. So um, now I'm just going to go through some examples, um, just so you can sort of get a feel for what's going on. Um, so if I just print A, right, this is the array I read in. I can look at its shape, its type, um, print out elements of it, deal with slices. Um, I don't know why they're building in funny order there. Um, if I assign items, I think I already showed you this, it changes. When I get slices, I can change slices. I can zero out items, get a bunch of zeros. I can make an array that where I specify its type. So now I'm going to make an array. Here, when I made zeros over floats, I can make an array where I specify the type, get integers. Um, I, there's another function called ones. So now I can assign all zeros. I can get all ones. A range, I think I already covered all these. Yeah, let's, I'm going to skip forward because I want to make sure we get to the num. Here we go. Matplotlib. Um, this is pretty powerful. Plotting function has got a lot of stuff in it. Um, <coughs> this is actually the way lots of people do stuff. I would, rather than just import as star or from, from matplotlib import star, you might import it as plt, and I'll show you some examples of what we actually do with using that. You can have a variable, if you're in Unix, um, probably something similar in Windows, where you can specify a bunch of default fonts, colors, and whatever. Um, and there's, if you go to the matplotlib.org website, there are tons and tons of examples, so you can see stuff there. Um, so if I just want to import it, so I import matplotlib as plt. Now I can call plt.plot and pass it in an array. And it's going to plot an array. And I'll show you what that plot looks like in a second. I can add some labels, and then I can show. right? So it doesn't actually show the array until I give the show command. So I can give a bunch of commands, then do show. Give some more commands, do show, and it'll keep updating. Um, if I do IPython with a PyLab, it's automatically imported. And then all I have to do is say plot, and it will go ahead and show it. And notice here I just said plot. Here I had plt.plot. That's actually because of how they were imported. In IPython with PyLab, everything is imported as star, so you just access the functions. So, so here's that, what that plot would look like. It's just going to put some numbers, because that was the, what I labeled it, um, and then show it. So it goes from one, to, uh, from 1 to 4, OK, is the vertical axis. I only gave it one dimensional array, so what does it do for the x-axis? It just used their indices, 0, 1, 2, 3. There's four numbers, so 0, 1, 2, 3. And if you give it 2D data, you can make it do more complicated things. Um, I can take data. And, and have a range of data. And then I can do something here. So here's a more complicated plot. I have plot of t. t is just from 0 to 5, stepping by 0.2. And I'm just going to plot t. Then I'm going to use uh, r dash dash in quotes. This says do a red dash line. Then I have t versus t squared. So t here is the x-axis. t squared is the y-axis. And that's doing as bs which is blue squares, t, t cubed, g, 
diamonds, so green diamonds, and that gives us this. Right? So not the most intuitive syntax, but not too hard after you've spent some time looking at it to figure out sort of what it's going to do. They can do more complicated things like histograms. Again, I'm going to skip over that. We have only a couple, or 10 minutes left of class. Um, you can do, do fancy plotting with tech and LaTeX in terms of their examples. Um, error bars, you can get it to plot data with error bars. Um, uh, so now I wanted to do images, just so you can sort of see what happens with images. Um, so in this case, this is a bunch of data. I'll show you some other examples. I can then show an image by doing PLT show if I'm in regular Python or just show I am show. And it'll plot an image. By default, it shows an image and a value of how to interpret the brightnesses. You can make it not do that. It gives you the X and Y locations of an image. You can change the color maps. So this has got showing the color bar, changing it to another color bar. Get lots of choices. So if I want to just plot an array. So here I have Z1 equals an array of 0, 1 to the 4. So if I take 0, 1, this is now a Python list array. What does 0, 1 times 4 mean? What does it mean when I take a list times a number? It appends that many times, right? This is where you got to be careful between NumPy and, and Python. So this is the array 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. OK, plus 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. OK, so that now it's got basically that was 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. So you made this array, and then it's times 4. So this is, an, this is a Python list structure that is now an 8 by 8 alternating 0 and 1 chessboard. And if I take that and I say image show that, it actually gives me the background chessboard. And I told it to do some interpolation, gave it an extent. In this case, I, I'm not going to show you the function, but this blue and stuff is another function. And I can do an alpha blend, put it on top of my other function. So um, enough of that. I want to make sure we get back to uh, the other stuff for just a second. Hmm? That was the last of those, but not the last of the clicker-related questions. I want to get back to these because, well, you'll see why in a second. Right? So in your assignment, you have to do some interpolation. So um, we have 10 minutes. Yeah, we can do this. OK. Uh, 12 minutes. OK. So suppose we recommend n-dimensional vectors by n element lists. Write a procedure, add n, to compute the sum of two vectors that are represented that way. And which of these functions, so you, I'm not going to actually make you write code for a second, but imagine in your head, which of these functions, or which answer here, gives you a way to add two lists that are n element vectors in both lists? Because you will need to manipulate such lists.
most people have voted, so go ahead and get your answer in. Okay, we have a pretty split class. Okay, so 57, I guess we lost somebody. Okay, so the correct answer to this was E, either B or D. So there's this function called zip that takes two lists and returns pairs of them. So the syntax here is, right, add X and Y for the tuple X and Y from the zip. Okay, this is not a particularly efficient way of doing it. It makes this, it takes the two lists, makes them into a bunch of tuples, and then you pull them back out and add them. The more efficient way is D, where you at index for I in this range, you index into each of them and add them up. But you'll see people using the zip function, so I wanted to sort of see that you can see that. Um, we're going to skip that one. Um, so we'll do this one. So now, again, suppose the same n vector by n element. Write a procedure that multiplies the vector by the scalar alpha. Oh, come on. Now it's in some weird state again. I have no idea. I mean, no, that, they did that because I touched it, but I'm trying to, to get my mouse over this one. It doesn't want to. It's neither red or green. I don't know what to do. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I have no idea what it's doing. No, the time on the left is counting up, and the votes are counting up. Well, I know, but normally the time counts down. No. No, no, it counts, no, it counts up. up. Okay. It's still not popping up. Yeah, it does. Try refreshing your page. <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> okay, it's high quality software. What can I say? Um, Okay, uh, well, we'll skip, skip over that. So the correct answer to this was B or C. So E. Okay, um, so this is basically scaling in arrays, right? So the last question, which is the one I wanted to make sure we got to, so write a fine combination going from vector V to vector W in 10 equal steps where you use this idea of S mult and, and, and add N. Okay, and given the amount of time, I will just sort of so what do you think that looks like? I have to go in equal steps. So how do I get equal steps? Uh, if I did it actually in NumPy, that would be right. Um, I need to go, but what's in a fine combination from the reading? So alpha u plus beta v. Okay, is a general affine combination. In this case, we're going to do a very special one. We want to do this. 1 minus alpha, because I want to go from u to v. Right? And this will now let me go in between the two of them. So as I go from alpha equals 0 to alpha equal 1, I will start at u and eventually get to w. Okay? And this is what you do in a blend. I, I take Originally, I have all of u or all of V, whatever that letter is, and none of W. And then I'm going to say step, and I, so the next one, so let's say I do 1U plus 0W. The next one will look like uh, 0.9U plus 0.1W, 0.8U plus 0.2W, and so on. Well, these two numbers keep adding up to 1, and then I'm taking this convex or affine combination of them. So in Python, that actually might look like that, where I have my add n function and my s mol function. Again, these slides will be online, so you can look at them. And I'm really going from, come on, mouse, um, i from i i over 10 and I, 10 minus i. So I got these two backwards. This is this is going to go from zero. Well, so this is 10 minus i, and this is i. And I'm, so this is actually going to start. If I started zero here, I started at one. But this is going to be 0, 9, whatever. And I'm dividing by 10 so that I have tenths. And that gives me a combination between them. And that will be useful when you try and figure out how to do the blending. 
And if none of that made sense, you can review the slides, maybe the videos. We'll see how they came out. Um, so for next class, in addition to having a programming assignment, there's a journal due on Monday and some reading to do. So while we don't have class next week, you have work to do this week or the week after. We just don't have class in the middle. Is the journal due Labor Day? Or no, no, no. It's due, it's due on Monday before the program is due. So the 12th. And it should, yeah, the week after Labor Day. And it should be in Blackboard already. You can see those. I will post my extra office hours for next week. A couple of you borrowed a clicker. Please return it.